It's a great privilege to meet you. Thank you. Mm. Um, not for the purpose of controversy, but I'm going to go with the honorific of Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, well, that's keep okay. going. No. Great. <laughs> um, and uh, before us here today, obviously we have cadets at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, mm. U.S. Air Force Academy, Virginia Military Institute, and the Royal Canadian Military College, along with their officers. And it's a rare opportunity to hear from a giant of Israel. And I'd like to begin with a fundamental question mm. and then want to get to the cadets' questions as well. Mm. It strikes me that you're actually, through your own life, something of the personification of the Israel-American relationship. Can you just give them in brief form how your life brought you to this closeness with the United States, working with the United States, and the vital nature of the connection between Israel and the U.S.? And then we'll move on to the next. You have sleeping bags there? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, went to the United States first as a child for a few, uh, for about a year, and then to high school when my father was doing some uh, research in the Philadelphia area. Then went back and served in the Israeli army in our special forces unit for five years as a soldier and officer. Then went to study at uh, MIT and uh, came back to Israel um, uh, and uh, uh, basically uh, joined the uh, uh, political world uh, after, uh, after a few years uh, and went to serve in, in diplomatic posts in the United States as the deputy chief of mission in our Washington embassy. I always uh, admired the United States enormously. Uh, I, uh, uh, I think there is a, a tremendous identification. Uh, Israel is one of the few countries in the world where being pro-American is one, very broad. Second, it is uh, uncontested. And third, it is never going to change. Uh, that's not always the case uh, across the board. And I think it's because the, there's a deep affinity. Uh, the United States uh, I spoke three times at the joint session of Congress. That's a great honor that was accorded to me. And I noticed on the wall opposite of where I was speaking, there was uh, basically uh, uh, a tablet of Moses uh, going to the promised land. Uh, and America was built around an idea, uh, the new promised land, and we are the original promised land. So that affinity, I think, is what binds us together in more ways than one. We are in a battle for the future of uh, free civilization. It is contested for many areas. Your job is to help defend it in the vital area of uh, military, uh, possible military confrontation. Um, and I think that uh, or to avoid it, you have to be very strong. Uh, but this, this confrontation uh, also uh, is challenged today by one uh, extremely dangerous uh, power, and that is Iran, which is controlled by a uh, theological uh, regime that says that America is the great Satan and uh, Israel is the small Satan. And I sometimes uh, talk to my European friends and I say, uh, you're just a middle-sized Satan. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, know, you can be the youngest and smallest, you can be the eldest and biggest, uh, but we're simply on the front line. If Iran, that chants death to America and death to Israel, in that order, uh, if Iran has nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them with orbital systems, that means that every one of your cities in Canada, in, uh, in America, anywhere else, uh, would be under the threat of... Uh, uh, basically nuclear blackmail and possibly the use of uh, nuclear weapons and that is a change of pivot of history that we cannot arrive. I've devoted much of my time uh, in office to uh, challenge that, to prevent that from happening and I think this will be the worst uh, security development uh, in the coming years that we must address not merely for our safety but for yours as well. So the affinity is deep, it's personal uh, but it's beyond that. There is uh, an affinity of uh, our common civilization that needs to be protected against those who would destroy our freedoms uh, and our values. Uh, and that's why I, uh, I particularly uh, welcome the opportunity to talk to you, because you are charged with defending just that. Thank you for what you're doing. So, um, so in 2015, I believe you gave a, an address to the joint session of Congress, and that's where you gestured to the statue of Moses at the back after your right. in incredible words right. there. 
You know, there are a lot of onlookers who say, by doing that, Prime Minister Netanyahu made Israel a partisan issue, which I think is total nonsense and ahistoric. There are others who say he's, he's gambling with the Israel-US relationship. You, beyond anybody, understands and has a mastery of the Israel-US relationship, and yet you felt compelled to speak and press Israel's case by way of a speech that I can tell you my heart was uh, thumping with pride as I watched it. Thank and you. I was thankful for it sincerely as a Jew from the United Kingdom. And I completely, completely applauded you from afar, literally. Yeah. Why did you feel compelled to go and speak? Explain to people, that's what I want. Explain why it was necessary and right for you to go and bring your voice, your powers of articulation to oppose the JCPOA, though it was in opposition to a seminal foreign policy platform plank for then President Barack Obama. Well, it's not, uh, you don't do this uh, uh, lightheartedly. Right. And it was quite uh, considerable reflection before I made that decision. But I did it because I thought that the future of my country was imperiled if I didn't do so. Uh, the JCPOA was a, a highway paved with gold to, uh, for Iran to become with international approval, uh, 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 a threshold nuclear state it basically allows them to reach within uh, a fixed time, regardless of what they do, regardless of terrorism, aggression, uh, ballistic missile development, or even weapons development, it allows them to reach the critical stage, uh, which is uh, in creating uh, atomic weapons, which is the uh, enrichment of uranium for the uh, uh, for the core of the nuclear bomb. If you want to think of what a nuclear weapon is, it's um, okay. It's a, it's a rifle. Okay, the rifle is the missile. Okay, the bullet in the rifle, the encasing is the weapon. The uh, um, powder, gunpowder, is the enrichment, enriched uranium or plutonium. That is the most difficult component to produce. You can make ballistic missiles, you can make the weapon itself, but the most difficult thing to do is enrich uranium, which requires very careful calibration, industrial sites, and so on. Uh, and it's it's very complex, uh, complicated thing to do. What the JCPOA does, it doesn't address the rifle, it doesn't address the casing, it addresses the powder, but it says that within a limited time, which right now, by the way, what's left is about two years. That's it. In about two years, Iran would have an unlimited capacity. That's if you go back to this agreement, okay? Iran would have the capacity to enrich uranium with centrifuges that they've developed now to be about 40 times more effective under the agreement than they had before to enrich uranium. So if, they, if this agreement goes through, Iran has immunity, uh, international immunity to develop the critical core in making an atomic arsenal. It just has mounds of yellow cake, okay, they have that, and they just distill it <clears> through this distillery called centrifuges, and they make the powder that goes into the weapon. Now that's crazy. It's enough that they don't cover the other things. It's enough they don't cover their aggression, their terror, uh, the delivery systems, the, the weapon, it doesn't cover any of that. But it actually makes, it does cover the enrichment and gives them the uh, international seal of approval. So Iran without the nuclear agreement is a poor country, an isolated country, and a country that has uh, no immunity from uh, the one thing that does stop nuclear weapons development by rogue states, and that's the threat of military action or military action. Or military action. An agreement doesn't stop it. Didn't stop it with North Korea. They had an agreement. Didn't stop it. With Syria, Syria didn't have it. We stopped it militarily. Iraq, yeah, they were all signatories to the NPT. We stopped it militarily. Libya had a, Gaddafi had a nuclear weapons program. He didn't, uh, uh, he, he was afraid that what we did to Saddam, the U.S. would do to him, so he gave it up. But uh, North Korea wasn't afraid of military action, so they had an agreement, both the NPT and nuclear agreements galore, who cares? They just did it. If you want to stop it, you have to be prepared to act militarily because uh, a poor, uh, the best agreement doesn't stop any one of these regimes. With or without agreement, 
nuclear, or rather military option can stop and deters Iran. Iran, in recent, uh, the last two years, is not afraid that there will be a military action, so they're upping the, their level of enrichment. You have to be prepared to act militarily or you cannot stop them. And once you don't stop them, then you're faced with a regime that has nuclear weapons. I think there's a little conflict, not very far north of it, that shows you how complicated things become when you have one of the sides, okay, invading another and they have nuclear weapons. It's a different thing altogether. That's not a theological regime, okay? Iran is like 20 North Koreas, 20 North Koreas, okay? More actually, 40 North Koreas in terms of GDP, okay? Mm -hmm. So that is a very, very dangerous, and with an ideology, death to America. So obviously I felt that having the JCPOA that gives Iran uh, this, uh, with this agreement, Iran becomes a rich country and uh, a nuclear threshold country and a country that is not, that is basically has immunity from the signatories of the, uh, of the pact. I said in Congress, and I say that today too, with or without an agreement, we will do what we have to do to uh, defend Israel. That was the reason why I went to Congress. I didn't think it was only our security and our survival that was a state, but also America. Now, do you challenge an American president? Well, if you have to. I mean, uh, Ben-Gurion uh, discounted the warnings of uh, the American Secretary of State and declared the state of Israel. Um, Prime Minister Eshkol on the eve of the Six-Day War, and the U.S. told him, don't act. He acted, because he had to, otherwise we would have been destroyed. Uh, and uh, that was my own uh, uh, concern as well. It wasn't a partisan issue. By the way, I checked, just so you know. I meet every congressional visitor here, okay? Mm -hmm. You'd say, well, not in wartime. No, in wartime, too. Check that, too. So I checked for, you know, the last few years, and I checked. and. I, I didn't plan this, but there were 300 visitors that I met, okay? 150 Republicans, 150 Democrats, <laughs> okay? So this is hogwash. In fact, turning it into a partisan issue was not my doing, but uh, uh, the sayings that uh, uh, basically, um, uh, it's a joke. And but false. I completely agree. And false. Yeah. I stand for Israel, and I stand there not as a uh, when I stood in Congress or any time anywhere else, I've challenged Republican presidents, I can tell you that. Uh, when uh, the second Bush administration told us to get out of uh, uh, the operation that we were doing against terrorist uh, strongholds and suicide bomb, uh, bomber nests in uh, uh, Janine and Shrem here, uh, I went to the Congress and spoke there, yeah. uh, with 50 con senators, 50 senators. So I didn't do that as a Republican or as a Democrat, I did it as an Israeli patriot. I so happen to believe that a strong Israel means a strong America. And uh, I think that's good for America as well. Um, that's the long answer to a short question. Yeah. I'd like to, to, if I may, just hit two other points. But before I do, there's, there's one thing I want you to say. So you're the son of a storied Israeli historian. There was another dimension there, which was that you had a voice that you could bring when in centuries past the Jewish people had no voice when looking down the barrel of their own destruction. How did that compel you? Well, I think this is the story of the country you're seeing today. I mean, the, uh, the Jewish people lived here from around 3500, uh, 3500 BC uh, to about uh, 700. That's about 700, uh, the 7th century, which is the Muslim invasion. Uh, we lived here and uh, were pummeled by the Romans, but continued to live here. Uh, wrote the great uh, works of the Talmud and the Mishnah here. People don't know that. After the destruction of the Second Temple, uh, which is familiar to uh, many of you because that's where uh, Jesus turned the tables on the money changers. Okay? So we were here for about 2,000 years. And then we lost our land. And when we lost our land, we were basically dispersed to the far corners of the earth, and we, uh, uh, we were slaughtered uh, in rising, a rising cycle of slaughters that culminated finally in the 20th century in the Holocaust. We were totally defenseless. Uh, and uh, uh, when I explained this, I, I was in China, 
uh, in my first term in office. I'd been in office five terms, no term limits, you know. <laughs> so in my first term, and I, it was 1996, I visited, uh, I visited uh, China, and it was led then by a different leader. His name was Xi'an Jinping. He's very jovial. Very, uh, I was very uh, impressed with Israel because of our agriculture and uh, uh, techniques and so on, which were nothing compared to what we have today, but made a big difference in China. So he was, he said, you know, the Jewish people are, you know, are great people. And I said, yep. I said, um, uh, you know, and he said, you're an ancient people. And I said, and so, and, and so are the Chinese. I said, that, yep. I said, you know, there's one difference. He said, what's the difference? He said, well, how many Chinese are at the time? A billion, whatever. A few. He said, well, and how many Jews are there? I said, in the world? At the time, about 12 million. And you saw all the jaws dropped there in that office. He said, only 12? Sir? I said, yeah. And I said, there's, that's a small number. If we've been around for thousands of years, because the Jews and the Chinese and the Indians, more or less, are the oldest civilizations on earth. Well, he said, what happened? I mean, we should have been around 200 million today. And I said, a lot of things happened, but essentially they boiled down to one thing. We lost our land. And when we lost our land, you, the Chinese, kept the land. The Indians kept the land. We didn't have a land. Dispersed, we were basically massacred. And that's what being a Jew meant for thousands of years. Uh, in our exile, you were massacred. America is an exception. But periodically, we suffered massacres, pogroms, expulsions, and so on. So the... The recovery of our uh, sovereignty and our return to our homeland uh, was accompanied also by the uh, by the essential component of recovering our capacity for self-defense. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. We wouldn't survive it in a minute. And recovering our capacity for self-defense meant that we had to uh, build. Uh, obviously, the first thing you need is what do you need to survive? Class. Over your head. Right? No, I no, not a roof over your head. We need you guys. We need we need an army, right? We need weapons. We need, you know, in today's terms, F thirty five drones, submarines, intel, you know. And there's one quality about, it, and we did, we developed that very nicely. But you know, as time, as the decades pass, these uh, weapon systems have, uh, and intel systems have one unfortunate quality. You know what that is? They cost a lot of money. So we had to build not only a military capacity that we had early on, but we had to create an economy, economic capacity. And for that, um, I led really a free market revolution here, mm -hmm. both as prime minister, but uh, also and especially as finance minister in the early 2000s. Okay? And we changed Israel. We turned it into a market uh, economy. I believe in free markets, but I also <laughs> I believe them also for a collectivist reason, not only for individual rights, but for a collectivist reason, because that, that's the only way we can create the uh, the wealth that is necessary to support a strong military, a strong military intelligence. Uh, we've passed in GDP per capita uh, Japan uh, and uh, Britain and France and Canada, no offense. Uh, <laughs> And uh, two weeks ago, I'm, I was informed that we passed Germany. And that's because we married our technological capacity that has a perpetual motion engine in our military, especially in military intelligence. But, you know, you come out of military intelligence, like my brother-in-law was a brilliant pilot and became a te brilliant technologist. And he was working here, you know, 40 years ago, he came out of 45 years ago, he worked for one of the companies, couldn't stand the bureaucracy, the taxes, and so on. I went to work for a small company called Intel. Uh, you know, his son came back here and just did these unbelievable exits <coughs> here. So we married the technological capacity that you have. Technological capacity by itself does not produce wealth. Science and education by itself does not produce wealth. Otherwise, the Soviet Union would have been a very wealthy country. It had the greatest mathematicians, physicists, metallurgists, you name it. All right? But they were dirt poor, and they still are. We married that capacity to free markets and created the other component. That is, you know its importance, you know how important that is. Uh, and we're an intelligence power. We are, uh, in my judgment, America's greatest ally in intelligence. You know the five eyes? Mm -hmm. 
You know the sixth eye? This is the sixth eye. It's called Israel. <laughs> and it provides a lot of intelligence to the United States. We receive invaluable American military assistance, which we've done with successful presidents, including, by the way, in a 10-year agreement that I had signed with President Obama after the speech in Congress. Mm -hmm. And that reflects, uh, first of all, the uh, support of the American people for Israel, understanding that basically we're a frontline bastion for free civilization, but also it reflects the fact that Israel is, uh, and we're enormously grateful for it, but also it reflects the fact that Israel is uh, giving the United States uh, very valuable military intelligence. How big, how much bigger is America compared to Israel in population? Not in territory, but population. About 40 times bigger, about 40 times. And what is the biggest collection agency in the world, in the Western world? The IRS. It's the NSA, not the IRS. <laughs> the IRS is bigger than anything, but it's the NSA. Well, I can assure you that the NSA is not 40 times bigger than our collection agency, uh, our uh, military intelligence collection agency. The NSA is not even 10 times bigger. So Israel is maybe a tiny body, but it has a huge head. And you know the value of military intelligence and military technology, and it's becoming more and more and more and more important. So the alliance between Israel and the United States is alliance, an alliance of values, but it's also an alliance of, uh, of uh, military, an intelligence alliance of tremendous uh, value uh, for both of us. Uh, so you ask, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the big difference? The big difference that happened here in the Jewish state is that the Jewish people, after uh, centuries of being defenseless, discovered the capacity to defend themselves. The attacks on the Jewish people, uh, anti-Semitism and so on, is not as old as time. It's about 2,500 years old. So those who wish to destroy us keep propping up. Today it's Iran. Uh, and sometimes they change. But what has changed is not that we are being attacked. What has changed is that we can defend ourselves uh, with a growing capacity uh, and with an important alliance. The most important alliance that we have is with the United States. That's the indispensable alliance. So that's what's changed. I'll take one more question if any of you want to ask a question. Anyone by show of hands? You can choose, sir. Yeah, anyone. You choose. Okay. I don't want to get into it. Okay. We'll go to the gentleman at the end. Ryan. Sir, thank you for coming. Cadet Myers with West Point. Um, we've been focusing a lot uh, talking about Iran, but I, I wanted to kind of change it a little bit. And I was curious, um, where, you, where do you think Israel um, will be focusing on China, considering the strong alliance that Israel and America have? Do you think that they're going to start shifting focus more, um, a little bit more towards China's One Belt, One Road initiative as they try to become a power, not only in the Middle East, but also in Africa. Well, I think China is already a world power, it's very clear. And the reason it got to be a world power is because they did at least part of the, uh, the rerouting of their economy to greater degrees of freedom. That's what uh, Deng Xiaoping did. And it had uh, enormous historical consequences. The entry of China into the uh, World Trade Organization uh, complemented that and made China a very powerful economic engine. They also are less concerned with patents, if you haven't noticed, <laughs> uh, and not only that. So obviously China is a formidable power, uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, not militarily here, but it is obviously this uh, capacity, soon there'll be whatever. Uh, their, their military spending is about, I think, 300 billion, something like that, right? Something like that. Uh, 350 already, it's almost half of the United States, their GDP is reaching up. And I think it's, uh, it, obviously, it's something that we have to uh, contend with. I was uh, happy to have Chinese investments here, but I said, you cannot have them in one field, in the technological military or technological intelligence field, obviously. We don't do it, and I said this openly to, uh, uh, to Xi and the Chinese chief of staff who came to visit me and said, well, you know, happy to have civilian cooperation and investments, but within limits, we've created a, um, an entity that uh, checks now 
I shall say, foreign investments in Israel to make sure without, I think, overburdening our robust economy with bureaucracy, but we want to have a mechanism to, to screen that. Uh, in a larger sense, I think that our great uh, misfortune was that in the first half of the 20th century, uh, the United States was not the leading power in the world, and we paid a horrendous price with the loss of a third of our people in the Holocaust. Uh, and I think the world paid an enormous price uh, uh, in the worst war in, in history. Uh, in the second half of the 20th century, we were lucky to have the United States assume the role of being the leading power on Earth. It coincided with the rise of Israel and our growing alliance over time, which was not accidentally connected also to our performance in the Six-Day War and after that. Uh, but I think that uh, the jury is out on the first half of the 21st century. And at least from my, my point of view, it's, uh, uh, it's an imperative for our free civilization to continue to thrive and survive that the United States maintain its role as the world's leading power. Uh, there. I answered your question as diplomatically as I did. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, so I know that we have to go, but I would like to acknowledge co-founder Rosie Tepini for bringing you to our group today. It's down to her hard work, and I thank you for your time and all that you've done, sir. Thank, well, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you. I want you, I want you to know that oh. uh, uh, my brother, who, uh, who died leading the Entebbe rescue, uh, had gone after he was first wounded in uh, the Six-Day War was wounded in the last battle in the Golan Heights, uh, and then went to study at Harvard, came back after a year. He made the dean's list, but he said, I have to be here in Israel, and he came in, and, uh, and he, uh, uh, he said, I have to be in Israel because even though I'm an invalid, his bubble was smashed, uh, you know, I have, to, I have to be among my friends who are doing reserve duty and fighting terrorists and so on. And, uh, it was around that time that I joined the army, and I was asked to go to officer school in our special unit, and I, I declined. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to the university. I was accepted to the, the Yale University at the time, uh, and uh, they accepted me three years ahead of time, which nobody else would do, and I said, I'm not signing up for two years of officer school. And the commander of my unit said to me, you go back to, you know, I'm giving you a weekend pass. You come back on Sunday, and you go to officer school, or I'm going to throw you out of the unit, <laughs> which was a fate worse uh, than death. So I didn't know what to do. I went and talked to my older brother, you know, he's now an invalid, he's a student studying mathematics in uh, Hebrew University. And I said, well, what, what should I do? And he said, oh, it's no problem, tell him I'll, I'll go in your stead. I said, well, you, you're an invalid, and you're old, he was 23. <laughs> you're old. You're married. You can't do that. He said, just tell him to look at my file. Pulled his file. And he was the outstanding cadet in our version of West Point. And he said, okay, bring him over. And now they had a problem. I didn't get through the medical committee, you know. They planned that as a military operation. <laughs> and they got him through. And then I went to officer school. And so the two of us were soldiers in the same unit. The reason I'm telling you that is because in the time that my brother was in the United States in his Harvard year, he was uh, operated in a hospital called Walter Reed. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I remember he spoke about the way he was treated, uh, and he spoke about it with glowing eyes. So I'm taking this opportunity to thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. 
Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.